Hello! Welcome to another episode of Ancient Office Hours by the Ozymandias Project. Trireme Transit is now boarding for all new and returning passengers. Now departing, present ponderings. Next stop is Ancient Office Hours at a library lost in the sands of time. Hey everyone, and welcome to episode 70 of Ancient Office Hours. This week, my guest is Trevor Cully, host of the History of Persia podcast. It was a treat to speak with another ancient world podcaster, and I was excited to learn more about Trevor and discuss his experience podcasting the Persians from outside the field. We spoke about why he started a podcast on ancient Persia, his hopes for the future of podcasting Persian history, and attempted to dissect the reception of Persians in modern media. If you haven't heard of his show, I highly recommend giving it a listen, as it is one of the only podcasts covering the history of some of the empires of Persia. I hope you enjoy this episode, and if you like what you hear, please give us a five-star rating and review us on Apple or Spotify. You can also subscribe to our Patreon, as this will allow us to reach more people and make more exciting ancient world content. Enjoy! Hey Trevor, thanks for joining me today on Ancient Office Hours. I want to start us off and ask you, where did you find this love of ancient history, ancient Persia? Ancient history and ancient Persia, obviously one kind of fed into the other. Um, Ancient history came from, I think, probably most common story in ancient studies of I was a kid and saw Indiana Jones and thought being an archaeologist would be cool and then learned what archaeology actually was and wasn't super interested in it but was really interested in the stories around it which is obviously ancient history Um, and the really formative experience in that regard was seeing the King Tut exhibition on tour uh, when I was I think 10 years old in Philadelphia Ancient Persia came through a religious studies class in my freshman year of college, literally the very first university class that I took um, on the first day of the first semester in school. I was in this honors program that had unique classes uh, and you lived with people who were in the same classes and everything. And this was a comparative religion course on the origins of different religions. And one of the topics covered was Zoroastrianism. So for our term papers, we were told to pick one of the religions we had covered and do an essay on where it's, you know, how it started. And I had no information about Zoroastrianism before taking this class, uh, The TA convinced the professor to give us extra credit for writing a short response paper to listening to the first episode of Dan Carlin's Hardcore History series on the Persians, which has nothing to do with Zoroastrianism. He doesn't get into religion in the series at all. But I listened to that to get the extra credit and thought and was taken with how little I actually seem to know about the Persians, despite them being this big prominent feature in Greek history and being a contrarian 18 year old white guy, I decided to do Zoroastrianism for this paper just got absorbed into it. And that was also really my first exposure to doing podcasts. So the two things kind of grew next to each other over the next couple of years. You know, I found Mike Duncan's history of Rome and said, well, is there something like this for Persia? Because I, went looking and there was something like that for seemingly everything except the one topic I wanted to hear about. So eventually I just said, well, fine, I'll do it myself. Nice, nice. I was going to say, the the podcast train I know is steadily picked up and and gotten more popular. But I mean, even 10 years ago, I feel like no one is really out here podcasting. Um, Yeah, I'm trying to think of I, I know of like two podcasts really and then it feels like suddenly in the last couple of years a lot of shows started, a lot of people decided it's like a really great medium. So what was it kind of like, you know, the the process of starting your podcast? Did you take, you know, were there any podcasts that you liked already that you were like, okay, this seems like 
a pretty good model or was it square one? Okay, I'm going to do my own thing. How do I do this? Oh, it was very much. I listened to Mike Duncan's history of Rome and said, well, I want to do that, but for a different place. Um, at the time I was commuting about an hour each way, both to work and to school every day. Um, or, you know, alternating days. I wasn't doing both on the same. Uh, so I was listening to podcasts constantly because I had minimum two hours a day with nothing else to do except drive and listen to something. Uh, so I got really familiar with that format and yeah, went through History of Rome in about two months, went through History of Byzantium up to wherever it was at the time and started getting into a bunch of other history of whatever place podcasts, but never the thing that I was most interested in. So I just took that format and applied it to Persia myself uh, over the course of a couple months in late 2018. Yeah, super, super cool. And I mean, how do you feel the reception has been? Like, did you discover this hidden audience who also really wanted this knowledge and to learn more about Persia? Uh, was was it, you know, how how is it building something that's like niche within an already niche so I went into it kind of knowing just after observing the, you know, long form narrative history podcast niche for a couple years that there must be some kind of audience for it because there's an audience for a history of China and a history of the Mongols and a history of Egypt and a history of the Inca. Like there has to be an audience for Persia too. I was not at all prepared for how large that audience was going to be as fast as it was. You know, I did my due diligence and learned about podcasting and everyone's like, you know, most podcasts only get a few hundred viewers. That's totally normal. Not everybody is going to be a professional. And, you know, I'm not making my living off of this by itself, but I'm not making none of my living off of it at this point either. It went from, you know, a few dozen people when I released because those were just the people I knew who wanted to humor me to, I think within two or three months, a couple thousand people and has been rising exponentially ever since. Um, you know, I also seem to have hit at a kind of sweet point uh, because I know a couple of other people who got into uh, the same kind of podcasting space around the same time. Um, like the Hellenistic age started, I think right before I did. And we both grew at pretty similar rates. There was this kind of, I think gap in the space for ancient near East outside of the typical Greco Roman narrative that, People had been circling around for a while with their stuff on the medieval world, their stuff on the early modern world, there's Egypt, there's Rome, there's Greece, and this gap was just kind of in there, and I think Derek and I both showed up at this point where people were getting fed up with that gap still existing, which is both of the us uh, started for the same reason. And I really like how, yeah, you, I can see how, like, the how you guys started up and you kind of mirror each other both in, in format. And I mean, your content doesn't always overlap, but there's, there's, there definitely is like a happy milieu there. And you know, like how has that, you know, do, do you like when you were making the decision to do your show and, and to keep it going, because obviously there's a, there's a whole ton of history uh, of of the ancient Persians, right? That no one no one has really covered in depth. Um, you know, do you foresee this being something that ends with a certain timeline, or is this the kind of thing that you know you can stretch even after you've finished the sort of more narrative elements of it? Um, is there like more you want to see done that you're like, oh, I could do this, or was it always like, let me just produce this history and then we'll have it? I would love for there to be a podcast that 
picks up where I plan on leaving off. You know, if someone wants to start that now and get going or someone picks it up later when I'm done, I'd love for that to happen. I'm not the right person to do it. Once you get beyond late antiquity and the Arab conquests and it becomes the kind of Islamic world for about 300 years is all just one big political thing, that's A, not the history I'm most interested in, and B, not something I have a ton of expertise about already. Going into this, pick up parts of especially the last ancient Persian Empire, the Sassanid Empire, with doing your research because they're just so much better documented. And you, you know, and there's a lot of debate about how they relate back to the earlier Persians. That is pretty solidly cut off with Islamization. Not like the culture completely stops and it's no longer Persia because it very obviously is. It's just everything about it politically becomes very different at that point. So I don't have kind of the pre-existing toolkit to keep going past about 700 CE without having to basically start over from scratch. So from the moment I started, I, you know, I don't, I had different dates at different times on the banner on my website, but, you know, kind of settled into this ballpark of 700 BC to 700 CE as this nice mirrored parallel that roughly covers everything I'm going to talk about. That said, I have about 300 years of epilogue already planned. I, you know, I'm not going to get to any of it until hopefully in this decade, maybe. Um, but that's going to be focused on kind of the dwindling of Zoroastrianism as a political force, uh, which is kind of where the legacy of ancient Persian culture really remains. But even after about 1000 CE, that's just not really a factor in any kind of narrative anymore. And that's kind of where I expect to run out of steam. Nice. And I mean, for a show like yours, it takes obviously a lot of preparation. And it was funny because before I started my new job dealing with ancient Persia, I mean, I'd only really, the, I think the only things I got from the Persian side was Cyrus was great and they fought the Greeks in a war right? Because uh, coming from the classic side, you just get, yeah, Persian War, barbarians, bad. Um, so, you know, there, there definitely was not a lot of um, care and attention paid to them um, in a classics department. Unfortunately, we just didn't have the bandwidth. And then my alma mater did not have a department of Near Eastern cultures and languages. So um, I couldn't even look for something more from a different perspective. So, you know, I, I'm curious a little bit about, you said obviously this love came from this class you took, which is awesome. When looking for source materials to even learn more yourself about this history, to go deeper and to be able to do a full show that's like scripted and t telling a very detailed um, like narrative here, what was your process like to try to, you know, go deeper and do you just like pick a book on the time or the topic or the person and then study that and like how did you go about finding all your sources well so getting into it before ever considering the podcast i was fortunate that the university where i started my undergraduate had a full set of the history of zoroastrianism by mary boyce which is now technically kind of outdated but is this very seminal series that is exactly what it sounds like. It starts with prehistory and you know, the linguistic and archaeological evidence, and then volume two is the Achaemenids, and volume three is the Hellenistic and early Parthian periods. Um, and unfortunately, Dr. Boyce passed away before she could you know, continue that series on. There was intention to go to like a nine volume set i think and there's always talk about one or two of her students picking up where she left off and it's never quite materialized but i had these books that covered most of ancient persia it really because of the 
lack of religious evidence, especially at the time she was writing in the 70s, is a narrative, is a political narrative of Persia and how religion was involved in that. So I had this really detailed academic text that was just a history of the Persian Empire as my starting point. It was the very first book I cracked open while writing this paper because it was what I was trying to outline for it. And I kind of went from that and then went to Wikipedia because that's where you start looking for things on the internet just to get a baseline of what I was reading about. And through that, I got to, you know, the citations on Wikipedia and basically every page talking about ancient Iran links to a website that's iranicaonline.org, which is the free open access version of the academic encyclopedia Iranica, which is an academic encyclopedia and extremely thorough. It covers every topic imaginable. There's a couple of glaring omissions because those volumes just haven't been completed yet. Like they haven't really got into the end of the alphabet. So there's no page on Xerxes. But other than that, it's very, very detailed. And you, there's a very funny trend I've noticed with it over the last couple of years that clearly some writers have and editors have picked which version of a spelling to use so that they could include it earlier and it didn't have to wait for a later volume. So that was really my starting point research tool. And then just going on like WorldCat and saying books about ancient Persia, what's nearby, what's in my university library. I transferred halfway through college, so I got access to a different set of books. And that's really you know, what my starting point was, was you know, just what does the library have? What's on archive.org? and what's on the encyclopedia. Very resourceful. Um, you know, kind of same, although my podcast is definitely not, um, I am not, it's not narrative based. I'm not telling a story, but that's why I'm always a bit curious for shows with different formats. Cause I know it's a, it's a different level of commitment and kind of along with that, since it's not, since your whole life is not revolving around, I'm making this podcast. This is my job. Uh, as someone who also loves studying and reading about the ancient world, I mean, I, I love picking up books. I love reading as much as I can. But there are some of those days where I'm just like, no, I'm tired. I don't want to do it. So how do you kind of fight through that when your show relies so much on that and you, you can't just sort of wing it on a on a certain day? So how do you push through and say, all right, no, 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 I'm, I'm going to read the chapter, the get you know, read the book? What I usually do w- when I get into that is I put off the complicated topical episode, you know, even if it means like skipping forward an episode or two to a different subject where it's just straightforward narrative. I'll just jump ahead a little bit in my writing process and write that first because I'll go and I'll reference and I'll make sure that I'm getting everything or, you know, maybe there's one random reference from an Athenian politician making a speech 200 years later or something that brings up an extra detail. But for the most part, my narrative structure is going to be whatever the biggest ancient source that talked about the period wrote about. And 90% of the time, if there's anything later, well, they're just saying the same thing in somebody else's words because they're citing the same sources that I am. Occasionally, more recently, as I get towards the end of the Achaemenid Empire, It's just a nightmare and I don't really get a choice because I have to reference five different sources for everything all the time, even if I stick to the primary ones. But up to this point, there was a there's a long span of episodes where I could just sit with Herodotus open and read through it and go back and check the secondary sources and the modern historians after the fact to see if there's any interpretations I wasn't aware of. But the narrative framework is going to be what Herodotus said, because he is the only source for basically everything up to the mid fifth century, which is the first 300 years of my show. And it's, it's so interesting. Um, as, as you're talking about this process, delving further into the, the actual writing scripting part, 
do you write it kind of like an academic paper? Do you sort of write it almost like an author trying to make sure it's still interesting while being factually correct? Like, you know, what, how do you approach the writing process just to make sure, you know, it's, it doesn't come off sounding too dry, too academic, but also accessible to people who really just don't know anything? That is something I struggled with a lot early on because I was in college and I was used to writing academic research papers. But those don't translate well to even like an audiobook format, you know, let alone a podcast where you're kind of supposed to develop this parasocial conversational aspect. And I've never personally been interested in a lot of the like dramatized storytelling style of podcasting. I started writing and I read my own scripts and said, well, no, this, I wouldn't want to hear this. What am I doing wrong? And I realized when I imagined myself doing the podcast when I was planning for it, I just kind of went through the things how I would want to say them in my head. So I just started writing it sh sort of stream of conscious, you know, more organized than that to make sure that everything's in order. But just writing the way that I would want to say it in conversation instead of trying to make it academic. Just, ex you know, how would I explain the academic things to my friends if I were telling them about it, at, you know, at my house? Nice. And did you discover along the way you had any hard and fast rules that you made for yourself? Like, no, I don't want to do this. Or, yes, I want to include this. Or was it just really there's... You'll, you'll put in which, which, whatever you, you end up with. I don't have any hard rules. There are a couple of times where I've sat down and said, all right, I'm including this for me and six other people. I don't need to extend an episode by 20 minutes to talk about the intricacies of, you know, one of the early examples was weapon design and armor styles in the Persian military. It's just not something most of the audience cares about. So that I relegated to a bonus episode on Patreon and told people where it was. You know, if you're dedicated enough in it to want to hear that stuff, you're probably also willing to spend $3 on it. So there's every now and then a topic like that where I decide that it's too niche for the show even though it's already incredibly niche and I get into you know, bizarre details about like different th theories of chronology about a specific treaty for 45 minutes. But I, those are always things where I feel like that's important to understanding the chronological narrative that's the basis for what I'm talking about. And if I need to expand on that, sometimes I throw it to a bonus episode. But for the most part, I include everything that comes to mind. And uh, the other thing that I do have a hard rule about is I always try to avoid going backwards. So if something else comes up and I realize there's some information I didn't have before or I didn't that I want to expand on, but don't want to include in the chronological order of episodes, that's other stuff that I'll put in a, a bonus episode, and I'll usually flag stuff like that as free for a while uh, so that people can see it, but it's not disrupting the flow. Because the other thing that I was really conscious of in creating the podcast is, like, I got into this because I started listening to a podcast that started in 2007, it, and I started in 2015. I knew going into it, like, people are going to find this later and be catching up, and if... I overly date it. That'll throw people or it'll be less interesting. I want to keep the flow of episodes consistent and not have long digressions about corrections that I might have already edited back in somewhere else that they've already heard. Yeah, that sounds like a really smart idea. Um, and, and it sounds like you've had now several, several years, because obviously with a show like this, I'm sure that you started your research and, and drafting and recording and making sure you had a ample store of things before you even started releasing. So it's, it's, um, it's always 
kind of fun to, to hear, yeah, how, how long ago did someone start before it went public? Uh, because when you obviously search online, you'll just see when did they start publishing. But the, the work the, on, on the back end starts long before. And like has doing this for the past several years now, you know, like you already had this this love, you already had this interest, and you know you're you're doing a lot of work that's pretty scholarly, pretty academic. When you know you're not in academia, like, do you ever kind of sit sit down and think, you know, oh well, I know so much. This would be kind of fun. Maybe I, you know, maybe you could go back to school, pick up another degree in this, um, or is it always been just no? pure passion hobby you know even you know wouldn't want to go back to school and and pick up a another fun degree just because you could oh when i started the podcast i had every intention in the world of uh getting a phd they accepted me into a program that i absolutely should not have been accepted into their expectations for me and what was on my transcript for my undergraduate were just not the same thing. Heading into 2020, they suggested I leave the program. And then 2020, there's a pandemic and I did leave the program. Uh, and I don't particularly regret it, especially because my wife is still working on her PhD in an utterly unrelated field. And everything I've learned from her experience and you know, being online and being a public history figure, I interact with plenty of professors in classics and history. And it's, it seems extremely unhealthy and abusive most of the time. Absolutely all of them talk about how terrible the job market is. It's not out of the question that I'll go back and I'll do grad school and I'll get some kind of graduate degree in some historical adjacent field, but it's not going to be a PhD in classics anymore. It's probably not going to be in Middle Eastern studies unless I get into the one uh, Iranian studies program on this continent. I definitely have you know, leveraged doing this podcast into writing pop history articles for a couple of places, um, varying levels of academic rigor. I feel like at this point, every podcaster is going to write a book. But like, I have, I don't know, 3000 pages of material on ancient Persia already written. It seems like it shouldn't be that hard to adapt at this point. Yeah, I mean, hey, if you wrote a book, I'm sure there's a lot of people who'd, who'd read it um, because you're coming into it from, yes, yeah, sort of a academic background, but also not, which I think is exciting because that's the one thing I think I repeatedly hear within academic circles, right? Which is, oh, well, people in academia sort of tend to, tend to stay there and do their own thing and then the general public doesn't really benefit from it. So it's hard to mix the worlds of academia and the general public. So I think, you know, it's it's a pretty cool, special, exclusive lane for people like yourself who, you know, podcast the ancient world and do it in an accessible way. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, it's it's pretty cool that you've set yourself up in a way where, like, you could go back and pick up some degree just because you want one. But at the same time, I think it's pretty cool that you're also doing something that hopefully will outlive all of us and will be around for people who, who really want to learn more about ancient Persia. I've, I've only really had the chance to listen to like one of your episodes just because I think it's it's you fall into the if you're so busy podcasting and, and do, doing your own thing, you seldom get to listen to other people's podcasts, which is a bit sad. Um, and at this point, I mean, you've been going along, you've been trucking along now for a couple years. So, you know, do you, because you're, you're so busy doing your own show and, and the research for it, and then you have your life on top of it, do you find yourself not wanting to listen to other podcasts kind of in the ancient world, ancient history space, because it's close to what you're doing? Or is it just like a lack of time? Or do you actively try to listen to other shows that vaguely cover something similar? For the first few years of doing my own show, listen to a ton of the other ancient world podcasters and made friends with a lot of people uh, in I think 20, late 2019, a uh, group of us kind of formed a discord server and that's been a great community to be a part of in the last year or two i've 
had more trouble listening to people doing my own style just because I'm so into that exact same thing all the time. But I have, I haven't stopped listening to history podcasts or things adjacent to my topic. It's just, I've been more prone to listening to things like Rex Factor or, uh, now some might, I know a couple of people who started, uh, so you think you can rule Persia in the same sort of model as Rex Factor. Um, and that's been fun to listen to because until pretty recently they were behind me and then they got ahead of me because they do one whole king per episode uh, and I do almost all of 2020 on Xerxes. <laughs> I keep up with things and I, you know, and I follow all, all of these people. I'm friends with a lot of them. I just don't necessarily have time to listen to all, I think, 237 podcasts I'm theoretically subscribed to. <laughs> yeah, I get that struggle because I feel so bad because I think... You know, I n- I never was like a big Twitter user before. And then when I got into the podcasting space in 2020, I was like, oh my gosh, there's like an amazing community of like-minded people. We're not all doing the same topic, but they they get the jam. They, they know the deal. And yeah, so I thought like, okay, I'll subscribe to all of these people's shows. And as I made more friends in the podcasting space, I was like, yes, I don't want to listen to your show and your show. Man, that's a struggle. It's kind of like the uh, never-ending Netflix suggestion list, right? So when the pandemic hits and you're like, oh, yes, give me all of your recommendations. I want to watch all of the things. Uh, That list has just grown and grown and grown. It doesn't feel like it's shrinking at all. And it's the same for podcasts. So I I kind of feel bad because I'm like, no, I want to listen to people's shows. I want to know what people are doing. But finding the time, geez, it's... It's hard. So, um, you know, other than the ones obviously you started and were inspired by, do you have some some particular favorites? Oh, yeah. Um, I mentioned So You Think You Can Rule. Um, I'm pretty good friends with uh, Roberto uh, and Brendan, who do the history of Sakartvelo, Georgia, as in the country of Georgia, uh, and Tsar Power doing that ranking style for the Russian monarchs. I've been following history of Egypt for almost as long as I've been doing history of Persia. And there's a, there's a couple, uh, that I interacted with and helped them get started or gave advice. Uh, the oldest stories is a good one that I think not a lot of people know about. Um, it's does the stories and the history of bronze age Mesopotamia. There's, there's just a ton of them out there. That is the, the thing. And like, there's also a lot more that are people who I'm good friends with whose podcast I just can't listen to all the time because I run out of hours in the day that I can have headphones in. Yep, yep. I get the struggle. So it's, uh, um, yeah, I don't know. Podcasting, it's it's a, it's an interesting space. I mean, did you have zero expectations of what it would be like getting into the podcasting space? Did you kind of have a faint idea and you know now that you're you're in it and and under the kind of niche ancient history podcast space um you know has it exceeded your expectations uh, you know what's that been been like for you just as you've been in it for a while now seen it grow seen it change oh exceeded my expectations is a massive understatement basically fallen out of social media Around when I was starting, Facebook had gotten to the point where I found it pretty much unusable. I had never been interested in Twitter. I'm still not particularly interested in visual social media like Instagram or TikTok. I just don't see the appeal of having to do a video all the time. But I got onto Twitter because I was like, well, that's that's the podcast thing. I ha- I'm at this on Twitter. I'm at this on Facebook and Instagram, whatever. Well, this is much more fun when you have followers. <laughs> I don't know why those people are enjoying being here because the, the only thing that makes it at all entertaining for me is being, you know, popular enough that people are interacting with me on here. That sort of connection and like community of people where you've got all these people interacting and feeding off each other and like doing public history in the same space was just really incredible. Uh, you know, both in the podcasting sphere where it's you know you have the very small bubble of ancient history podcasts and a slightly larger bubble of generally history podcasts but also the 
public history, academic, classics Twitter side of things where there's a bunch of tenured academics or trying to be tenured academics who are also promoting their work and sharing things on, on there. And it creates a actually kind of complex ecosystem if you're in enough different bubbles like that. Having that community has been great. And like I said, pretty early on, I got in, invited into a Discord server with a that as it was forming, um, that has been a great community for support and help and advice and stuff like that. I think the rate of growth for my show was really influential in like how I fit into this niche because from a really early point, people started asking me for advice I, in starting their own shows. I was like, why are you asking me? And I think it's because I was this new medium sized podcast that was being well reviewed and building an audience quickly. So I was both not like so huge that I didn't have direct messages and didn't check my email because I don't need to see feedback all the time because I wanted to see, I still want to see my feedback all the time. So I was accessible, but also like, at least had the impression of being successful, which was a really surprising role to suddenly take on in this community that I had only at that point when it started been a part of for a couple of months. I mean, hey, kudos, though. There was an audience. People were interested. They helped you grow. And that's awesome. I mean, hey, you put in the hard work, so I'm glad to see it pay off. Um, and I'm kind of curious... I believe, if I remember, you do a couple of interviews, uh, in, in interview styles with, with experts, right? Yeah, I do it when it comes up. There's not a ton of publication uh, that I, you know, that's in my field that is at a level that I want to promote to my audience. Some of them have approached me and asked me if I would be interested in doing the interview. And I said, yes, of course. Others have been people I reached out to because either I wanted to promote their work or because they were doing work on specific topics that not a lot of other people have done work on. So if I'm going to use their work almost exclusively to talk about something because they're the only person to write about it, I might as well just get it from them. So it's it's been a kind of mix of those things. Um, you know, I think the most recent one I did was the with the author of the very first book, the very first academic book on the Achaemenid military. I was excited for his book to come out and, and immediately reached out and said, do you are you interested in coming on? I'd love to talk to you about it because I was frustrated with my resources on that because all I could find were a, an odd paper here, an odd paper there that were mostly like comparing and contrasting to the Greeks and two like wargaming books. And then the sample chapter of this academic book drops and in, and it's the historiography chapter and those are the books that he's referencing, too, because they're the only ones that exist. <laughs> and so that was both gratifying and then immediately made it something I wanted to tell more people about because this resource is brand new and a very big deal for this topic. Yeah. And so kind of along with that, since you do sometimes bring someone on, um, I'm curious for someone who does so much research and and gets to learn about and see so many more sources than the, the average person. Um, is there a scholar that studies something in particular who would be like dream guest who you'd love to have on, who you just haven't found the right fit yet? I'm, I'm always a bit curious as someone who my entire show is basically interviews. So uh, I get to talk to a lot of people that I sometimes were sort of familiar with, other people not at all. So I had to do some research on them. But for someone who doesn't, normally make that a staple um yeah do you have anyone that you're like oh man i'd love to have this person on there's nobody who is like a goal to have on the show um i would love to get uh a professor named matt waters um 
he has written a couple of relatively short books. Um, you know, one is a very introductory level, brief overview of Persian history. One is a, the most recent one is a biography of Cyrus the Great. But he's also been a big factor in the expansion of including Elamite evidence, the pre-Iranian culture of southern Iran, in the discussion. I think kind of the next big frontier for reinterpreting some of the Persian evidence. And because he's published some of those introductory public level books, I think he'd be a good fit for someone for me to talk to. Just didn't work out for his most recent book, but I still did a book review uh, requested by his publisher. The issue with seeking out interviews, especially in a Caymanid studies where I am now, is we're kind of at the end of an academic generation um, in a field that's really only a generation or two old. You know, there wasn't really an organized study of the Achaemenid Persians prior to the mid-1980s. It was, you know, how they show up in Greece and how they show up in Egypt and how they show up in the Bible. And they were all kind of separate disciplines that didn't talk to each other very much, which led to a bunch of different interpretations based on local evidence. And they, and a bunch of scholars got together in the Netherlands over the course of the mid 80s and kind of hammered out a framework for how this is going to be one single topic, which is great. That meant that like the ideas that they came together and formed in 1985 are the ideas that have kind of defined everything written since then. They're not all necessarily holding up anymore, but nobody's really worked out what is the next standard. There's definitely a generational divide in how people are talking about it uh, in s scholarship and public history. The The big example I can point to is a, a book that recently came out that I'm not going to specify because I don't want to promote it in particular. Just kind of hand waves and says, and there, the revolt in Egypt when Darius the Great became king wasn't particularly significant. And this is a scholar who was getting his PhD during these conferences or just after these conferences and studying under all the people who were organizing them. But uh, Izume Winjinsma, who I've interviewed on the show, just Google the Egyptian revolt in the Behistun inscription. Her paper is the very first thing that come up, and one of them is titled, Egypt, the most significant revolt of the Behistun inscription. So there's, you know, there's these reinterpretations of evidence going on that are not getting universal traction yet. So it's not clear who's like a dream guest right now because everybody's kind of up in the air. Well, the good news is you have so much more history to go. So you might discover someone along the way. I mean, yes, Akamena Studies is a... It's it's a long period of history, so I'm like I would imagine it would get you quite, you know, it'd go um, go on for a bit. So I'm I'm sure you know if you get to the, the Parthians or the Sasanians, things might spark interest, spark joy. So I'll be I'll be curious and I'll be interested to see who may present themselves as a uh, a good option to talk to. It's very easy to pick people to interview for the Parthians because there's like three of them. Uh, and I've met two. For the Sasanids, it's a really easy list. There's three or four authors who, uh, who have done really solid or really interesting either introductory or groundbreaking work that I'd love to talk to. Uh, they're just not on the slate yet, basically. Um, and yeah, I, you know, who knows? I, I'm sure plenty of people will get the, their own PhDs and publish sometime in the next 10 years before I get to the end. So there will be new people to ask questions to by the time I'm finishing. Exactly. And, you know, I guess in your epilogue stuff, you can always go back and then release stuff as bonuses. If you're like, wait, okay, actually, I wanted to talk to this person because there was a new development in recommended studies or something. I don't know. Um, you've. It sounds like you've left yourself a lot of good leeway just for, okay, I can accommodate this in a different way. Um, but what I want to do is, is shift a little bit and just ask you real quick here, um, you know, how has your experience in podcasting ancient Persia shaped your reception and perception of seeing ancient Persia brought to life on the big or little screen? 
Um, we don't really show the Persians a lot. Uh, I think what we have is like the three hundreds and then one or two things. But yeah, I was going to say what Persians on what screen? I, it really is just you know maybe they show up at a TV episode here or there, but it's it, three hundred is the cultural image of the ancient Persians and has been since it came out like almost tw- twenty years ago. Tw- 18 years ago, something like that. Yeah, I think it came out in... Was it 2005? I feel like it was 2000... No, 2006. Somewhere somewhere in the you know mid-late aughts. Um, I've done uh, review episodes on both movies uh, as bonus episodes. Um, I think they're still actually flagged as free because they're just really popular. Even without learning anything about ancient Persia, you, don't, you can watch those and be like, well, this is obviously wrong because... If you use any amount of historical criticism, you know that they didn't have lobster men or zombies in their army, and there probably weren't battle rhinos, um, which make great visuals uh, and do a great job of painting things as you know scary and alien to the protagonist, exaggerated, racialized comic book. At, to the point that, like, I'm not even sure most Americans were fully cognizant of the fact that, like, the Persians of those movies were supposed to be equated with modern Iran. Like, I know a lot of Iranians get upset about it. I'm like, I don't know how many people over here realize that's you guys. Like, that they're, they're alien monsters with bone knives for fingers and zombies and ninja costumes like nobody's associating that with anything specific the the second movie is the one i have real problems with uh because of it how they portray artemisia just everything i have already a you know 30 minute rant about this on the internet already i don't need to go all the way through it here but just they took this really interesting you know, Greek queen who was not just on the Persian side, because there were tons of Greeks on the Persian side, they ruled part of Greece, a staunch loyalists whose family, you know, kept their territory in the empire after all of their neighbors had left, made her a rape victim and sex slave taken from a peasant family and raised in the royal court for some reason and a weird love arc slash hate arc with Themistocles. I, I, it's the most bizarre storytelling choice for a character who's already really interesting and compelling. You didn't need to dramatize her story at all. And it's just, you know, one, you don't need to add those elements to a story that is already interesting without them ever. You certainly don't need to add them to an existing, already interesting character. Never mind that that one's also the one, like, it goes much further out of its way to be less historical with, like, Darius dying in the Battle of Marathon to, like, make the Greeks extra important to Persian history as if they're not the primary source of everything we know already. And it's my biggest shame with that, though, is that the second 300 movie is was nominally going to be based on Frank Miller's follow-up comic to the original 300 called Xerxes, but Miller didn't get it out fast enough, so they based the movie on kind of the first chapter that he had finished and could show them. The com- you know, the movie doubles down on all of the worst things about the first 300. The Xerxes comic shows a really surprising degree of personal reflection from Frank Miller. It refocuses on Persia and Persian side stories and, you know, takes the world that he created with the first one. That's this bizarre alien thing where Xerxes is a nine foot tall, hairless alien monster kind of humanizes that side of things within the framework of the world he'd already written. It has some elements that do seem to be recognizing the flaws and the kind of misguided, hateful elements of the original story and making up for them. And it's a shame that like that didn't get adapted to the movie because that would have been a much more enjoyable follow-up 
and instead they went hard into the worst elements that they could. Has there been something since the 300s, both of them, that you think does better? You know, they've been portrayed, I I think they made a very small, short appearance, but they they were in, well, they were in the Alexander movie with Colin Farrell for like three seconds. Um, but then obviously we have modern, modern uh, like video game portrayals of them. So we have the, uh, the whole Persian arc in like Assassin's Creed Odyssey. So, you know, have you seen, do, do those seem to be better, like moving in a better direction? They, they definitely seem to be moving in a better direction. It, it, there was a span for most of the last decade where, even if it were a more positive portrayal, everything's aesthetic was based on 300 so that popular audiences would know what you're, what they were looking at. And we're finally kind of moving away from that, I think, now just that those movies are more in the rearview mirror. I unfortunately have not had a chance to play Assassin's Creed Odyssey yet. Uh, from what I understand, there's some weird storytelling choices with how they play the Persians. They do that with everybody, though. It's just like, even within the Assassin's Creed storytelling, it's a little strange which characters they choose to do which, you know, historically unusual roles. I like the including them in the assassin story, though, because there's so many prominent assassinations in Persian history. It's almost a shame that they went with the Peloponnesian War period as their framework instead of, like, Alexander, if you were going to do that era, because... There's just more weird assassination related things and more, you know, world conquery characters to make your antagonists in there. Whereas the Peloponnesian War is kind of where it's winding down between Greece and Persia. The one place I've seen a lot of great pop portrayal actually is indie graphic novels. A lot of interest in that, apparently, especially the Alexander period, because he's always such a compelling main character and one of the few people in history who really was just a protagonist of their own life, where people are putting in a lot of effort to try and consciously not be 300, which I think is a good sign that people are kind of recognizing that that goes too far and correcting back to, you know, at least make people look like historical people, you know, if, even if you're going to dramatize the story. I'd love to see more Persian stories on screen. Great drama that's in there. There's absolutely room for a Game of Thrones style deep political action drama just out of the Behistun inscription of Darius the Great. It's the story of a two-year civil war on eight fronts with three people pretending to be the same dead prince. How that's not already a movie, you know, or even if you recast it and made it a story set in a different place with all of the same story beats... I don't understand how it's not a common story to adapt. Oh, man, that sounds great. I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there's some great kings, especially during the Achaemenid Empire. I'm like, guys, that's a whole chunk of history. I'm actually shocked we don't have some, like, epic HBO miniseries on Cyrus the Great. I'm like, he was so influential. Why do we not have an HBO? Like, if if we could have, like, an HBO Rome type of thing, but for the early Achaemenids, I'd be super happy with that. Cyrus is both a blessing and a curse with that because there's about four actual sources for his entire life and none of them are particularly detailed. So from a historical fiction standpoint, he's basically a blank slate. As long as you hit the same like four or five beats, you can do whatever you want with that character. You can make him as independent and dynamic or as much a puppet of other people as you want and you can't contradict history because there's just nothing there. On the other hand, there's so little there that it's kind of hard to build a character out of him. And he's so valorized in modern Iranian pop culture and propaganda that you do run the risk of alienating an audience no matter how you portray him. That's why I always go for, like, Cambyses and Darius would make the best series of television or movies because their their stories are more known and more detailed and utterly ridiculous. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I see both points. Obviously, I like going with the ones where we have more historical evidence for, so we, we do kind of have someone we could 
make a character model. But see, I th- I feel like that would be part of the fun for Hollywood. You 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 get a blank slate like Cyrus. You know, you could have him, be, you could give him this whole, like, Avatar The Last Airbender, Prince Zuko arc, if you wanted, as long as you hit on what we have. I'm just, you know, like, oh, uh, 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 like a Cyrus Zuko is like, that. that's a great image in my head. Um, so I would think that as a creative, as an, ex- as an executive, because you have so few evidence, you could literally be like, yeah, I'm going to make the most interesting, redemptive character, so you see how terrible what an asshole he is and then suddenly this is and then you could kind of create your own how does how do you think cyrus the great became great and then you could have this dialogue on was he really great do we just call him great you know it's the same thing that i kind of wish that people would do with um with alexander we've just been just taught that alexander's a great this and that and the other thing and he was really great but i think especially from the persian side there's so many people questioning them being like but but was Alexander really great? Because I'm not sure if he was. Let's talk about it. Oh, and on the Persian side of things, Sassanid and early medieval literature, he's Alexander the Accursed Roman. There, there is an angle to take with that, I assure you. <laughs> I love it. See, that's what I'm like. Yes. So this is what I want. All right, executives, get on it. I want to see like a Zuko-like S- Cyrus, and then I want dialogue about why do we think he's great today? Like, why? Help me answer the question of why did Thomas Jefferson have his like? Why, why did why did he study and love Cyrus so much? Like, these are these are great questions um, that I would love to have answered in some kind of medium. Um, before I end the interview portion, I did want to ask you. As someone who podcasts in specifically ancient Persia, which is, you know, yes, it's under like ancient Near East and and a lot of these smaller fields and regions get very confused for people who just aren't familiar. How much do you find that people confuse the ancient Persians with like the Assyrians and the Babylonians if they're to look at like a piece of art and then you say, ah, yes, isn't this beautiful Lamassu Persian? And you're like, no, that's Assyrian. So how how much do you tend to find people just kind of mix up because they really just don't know the the differences in the ancient, um, you know, Mesopotamian, Middle Eastern um, cultures? Oh, especially in the world of art. If it's not specifically academic, you just kind of toss a coin and someone's going to say Babylonian, Assyrian, or Persian. And it doesn't matter where it came from or what the style is. Like People are just going to guess it's one of those three, and it really just depends on which name people have heard the most, I think. And there's something to that, especially with the Persians, because Persian art very consciously mimics Assyrian art, often to represent very different types of scenes. So... Yeah, you can definitely be forgiven for seeing Persian artwork and going, oh, well, that's Assyrian, if you don't know that, well, the Assyrians would never have portrayed something that peaceful. <laughs> like, um, or the Persians never would have portrayed a battle scene in their artwork. It's just not a thing that they did for some reason. But, you know, it's all, especially, I think if color were preserved, people wouldn't have quite the same reaction. Uh, but especially because it's all just the same tan sandstone and basalt reliefs in the same styles over about 3,000 years of history that you get, you know, they all just blend together in people's minds. And I don't really fault people for that, especially when, you know, the same beard was in style as the symbol of kingship for 3,000 years. It's hard to fault anybody for getting, for making those mistakes. If I didn't look at them all the time, I wouldn't catch when something was specifically Persian or not. Even knowing, you know, what de- what defines Persian art, I would definitely still make mistakes about just, especially the more abstract things like sphinxes and lamassus and, you know, which type of flower the kings hold to show their royalty. Like they, w- they would just blend together for me, too, if I wasn't specifically looking at them on a regular basis. I was going to say, yeah, I think bull heads are like the most confused thing because you're like i don't know where that came from did that come from persepolis did that come from nimrod sure like people just don't know um and and lastly though i am curious do you find that people most often confuse ancient persia with ancient assyria in terms of like aesthetic yeah there's just not enough writing from 
the time to really know how they connect, but it's very weird because the Assyrians had kind of been trampled into the dust uh, and lost most of their high literary and artistic culture by the time the Persians show up, but you have these Babylonian artisans as the most likely candidates for who's doing the carving, and then they're being very explicit about mimicking Assyrian styles and not Babylonian ones um, in a lot of the Achaemenid artwork. And the differences to any modern observer are, you know, minute to the point of not existing for most people. Um, So when people do make the mistake, those are the two that look the most similar, which is ironic because thematically they represent extremely different things in their artwork. The Assyrians are very militant in what they portrayed, and the Persians as far as we can tell, tried to avoid portraying militancy in their, you know, artwork and propaganda as much as possible. You know, it's strange how little they portray fighting in most of the Persian artwork. Fair, fair. I find all of the artwork from that region beautiful. So when I see something, I just go, oh, how beautiful. So, um, yeah, well, I, I, I will say um, I myself am guilty of looking at something and, and, thinking it might be Assyrian or Persian, and then I usually get them wrong. So it's uh, it, it's hard. And uh, I will say for anyone who, who has a trained eye who can spot the differences, that's um, quite impressive. The last thing I do on my show is I ask each guest if they will read Shelley's beautiful Ozymandias poem. And then after you've read it, if you could give me your quick thoughts on why do we as like a culture find this poem so interesting so well done um you know is it the themes is it just is it the way it's written um you know any anything you've you've uh observed from it i met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert Near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear. My name is Ozymandias, king of kings, Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. So this is always something that uh, stands out to me and comes up in my studies because it uses the phrase king of kings. But it stands out, one, because Shelley was just a masterful poet and wordsmith who knew how to write something evocative about just about anything. I think part of what makes this stand out to us is that from just before Shelley's time and probably forever after now, we are always looking at the wreckage of something, you know, whether that's truly ancient or something lost and dug up from the relatively recent history, there's always evidence of the passage of time and the loss of past feelings and messages, you know, whether it's a statue of a king or a building where it's just the facade standing around an empty shell uh, and you don't know what that building was originally for. There is a certain mystery to it, but also you know, a clear message presented by what we're still able to see. Yeah, yeah. And I will say this poem, in addition to just having cool language and cool themes, um, it's always been my favorite poem, I think because of the nature of legacy almost and almost the ephemeral nature of political power, which this man obviously had. It's it's clearly a, a, a very strong statement saying, you know, it's a memento mori, a reminder that we will die, you will die. And what will be left behind? Are we building all these statues? Are they going to still be here for eternity, which is presumably what they were hoping to build for? Well, it's not here anymore. I mean, we can dig them up. 
but would we have found them without the archaeologists? So, so there's like layers and layers and layers to the poem. And when thinking almost about it that way, the last question I like to ask every guest on the podcast is, if you think for a minute to our society right now, today, do we have like a modern Ozymandias, whether it's a person, a place, a thing, a concept, like, you know, is there something we can think of today that we think is amazing that will last forever? But realistically, will humans in like 300, 400, 500 years think the same? Or will they be like, man, these crazy people, (laughs) what were they thinking? I think in terms of people, we feel this way, especially in the United States and sometimes even more in more ephemeral democratic and Republican societies like the UK that, Oh, this leader is going to be really significant. This is the biggest election of our lives. Well, I've heard that every presidential election of my entire life, you know, my earliest memories are formed around 2000. So every, every election since I, can remember has been the biggest election and most important election ever. We never know which ones are actually going to be influential. We never, you know, we never know who's going to have a real lasting impact or who's going to, you know, cause a lot of disturbance in the present that just kind of ends up a footnote, you know, especially when your society and culture moves in four year chunks at a time, you can never really predict how long, you know, what the lasting effects of any four-year period are going to be until you're about 20 years out from it. I think the the most Ozymandias-like thing in the modern world that we feel is eternal, and I think people know that about people, but the thing thing that we feel is going to be eternal and last forever, I think mostly to us today is the internet, especially since the advent of social media, we've all been told, oh, what you put on the internet is going to last forever, and it's just not true. You know, I, there's really not been a point in time where the historical record has been more unsafe because you can copy things on paper and copy them forever. And, you know, as long as you make more than one copy and don't light them all on fire together, there's a good chance one of them will survive. But when everything's stored on, you know, three companies' web servers, all it takes is that those for those to go away, for there to be some kind of problem with, you know, any one set of systems, and it's all gone. And, you know, so much of what we do now is created and preserved and only exists on the internet. You know, what we're doing now only exists on the internet. If that goes away, and eventually it will, because even underneath all of this digital media and cloud storage, there's a physical server with a disk somewhere that stores it all, that eventually those things wear out. And if you're, if we're back to the middle ages of we have to make copies forever or it won't be there. We don't have a plinth to etch everything we know in stone on, like in the poem. We just have these really, really ephemeral records. And I think people take that for granted. No, those are really good points. You know, I hadn't thought about the nature of elections themselves. I mean, I think I've heard a lot of individual people, but it's a really good thing to consider. I I think now thinking back, you know, my earliest memories as well, being a kid, I think my the first election where I was like really, really paying attention that I would like take my parents' campaign signs was I think 2004 which is like that's pretty recent um it is interesting to think though that just just based on like where we are now it's hard to get any real perspective because a lot of it is still so new but you know if i'm thinking about that right now i'm like well 2008 might be pretty significant just because of you know who got elected and the significance in this country at least and then i was like well 2016 was big and then 2020 equally as big but who knows like will all three be just hugely important for everyone for as long as this country exists or i wonder if honestly one or all three could be blips i i i mean i can't imagine at least two of them will be blips but hey maybe i think 2008 will be in the history books forever because 
in a country whose history is so marked and defined by race relations, electing a black president with Barack Obama was a really big deal, if for nothing else. I don't necessarily think his presidency and like his personal character is going to be what makes him a historical figure, in part because of what happened immediately afterwards and rolling back a lot of that. But I don't think we can really tell, like, I think we we have to see what comes after, what happens when, you know, this set of 80-year-old figures who are dominating our cultural consciousness these days are gone in five to ten years. What does the situation after that look like? You know, I think, you know, where where are we in 2028 is really going to be how significant were any single events of the last 10 years just because they all have been so dynamic changing in the moment but if that moment galvanizes the right set of people or the wrong set of people it goes in a very different way uh and we don't know which way that is yet that's very true i mean as you were mentioning hopefully these people these like octogenarians controlling everything at the top you know, from your lips to God's ears, they will be gone in just, at the most 10 years. I'm kind of just like, look, man, if some of these folks are like 83, I'm like, can you just retire in the next like four or five? That would be like great, if not sooner. Yeah. Even if they're gone, you know, some of them are going to keep their Twitter accounts, though. Like that's <laughs> unfortunately. So I'm kind of like, OK, that's that's the thing is that I worry about. I'm like, even if they technically retire, I still have to hear about these people now. <laughs> I know. Well, I'm kind of just like, well, maybe some of, I mean, you know, I never want to wish ill upon people, but I'm also kind of like, there are some people who are like 85 in government who I'm kind of like, well, realistically, are you going to make it to 95 when life expectancy is going down? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I mean, government's a pretty stressful job, you know, all that stress might take its toll. We don't know. Um, that's very speculative. But, okay, I kind of lied. There is one more question I'm going to ask you, and that is, where can people find you, your work, your show, all this good stuff, if they want to learn more about the the wonderful and, ex- and, and just, like, interesting world of uh, ancient Persia? Well, presumably you can find my podcast, wherever you're listening to this right now. Um, it's technically on YouTube. Uh, I'm working on making it actually on YouTube. There's, like, one episode there right now. To find me, you can follow me on social media at History of Persia on Twitter and History of Persia Podcast on Facebook and Instagram. As new social media sites develop, it will be History of Persia there, whatever those happen to be. To find information directly or get in touch with me, you can go to historyofpersiapodcast.com. Great. Well, we will link all the things to find your show in our show notes. And again, I want to thank you so much for coming on my show. It's been real fun to talk to you, get to know you, and a little bit more about your show and your process. It's always just a really really fun day when i get to talk a little shop with a with a fellow ancient uh, history podcaster so thanks again for coming on oh, of course thank you for having me i had a great time trireme transit is now departing ancient office hours next stop is present ponderings